Uh, with that, uh, delighted to be introducing Elizabeth and Seth. Elizabeth McBride, to my right, is a writer and traveler. She lives in Alexandria, Virginia, um, and yes, made a special trip out to Boulder uh, to be with us tonight. Uh, she is a proud Terrapin. I know, I'm, I'm pretty proud. I know you're a Terrapin. You know, Definitely I, proud. I was the editor of the school paper, so super proud. I learned to count by twos at Maryland basketball games growing up, so I, I could still sing the, the Maryland fight song if, if pushed. I uh, also did her graduate work at George Mason University. Um, Elizabeth is an international business journalist. Uh, her work has been featured in publications that include the Washington Post, the BBC, the MIT Tech Review Courts, and other prominent publications. She founded the Times of Entrepreneurship to share the stories of many often overlooked entrepreneurs that she has met through her travels in the world. And she is, of course, now a co-author of The New Builders. Please help me welcome Elizabeth McBride. Seth Levine is uh, the pride of McAllister Co College, uh, lives here in That's Boulder nice. with his family, a longtime venture capitalist, and he is a co-founder and managing director at the Foundry Group. Um, Seth spends time as advisor to uh, venture funds, as well as startup companies uh, truly around the world. Um, also, uh, Seth, and I think this um, connects nicely to tonight's discussion, um, I think long ago recognized how impactful the entrepreneurial form can be in ways outside of a, a scalable company that's generating wealth, uh, primarily for the founders and investors. Among other things, um, he was a longtime board member of something called the Unreasonable Institute, which is an absolutely fantastic uh, operation here. It got going about 2007, and some vestiges of it are, are still around. Uh, I don't think I knew this before like, checking LinkedIn. You were one of the, the founders of Pledge 1%. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take a quick moment to plug that? Uh, it's a great program. Yeah, it's literally the best thing I've ever done in my life other than having children. <laughs> uh, Pledge 1, you should all join it when you start your company. So Pledge 1% is a now a global organization. Um, it really was spawned in, in part in Boulder. The, uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce was a co-founder. Scott Farquhar from uh, Atlassian was also a co-founder along with Ryan Martins uh, and a couple other folks myself. Um, and basically we encourage companies to give 1% of equity, profits, time, uh, or product to nonprofits in their uh, local community. They basically, it's pretty audacious in the sense that like they give equity at a time when it's worthless. And then eventually, perhaps it becomes worth something. Um, we've already generated more than a billion dollars back to charities around the globe. It's, it's been amazing. There are about 20,000 companies now that have taken the pledge. You can take the pledge as an individual and pledge some of your own stock. You can pledge your company stock and again, time, uh, product and profit. Foundry, uh, my company has pledged a portion of our um, carried interest and we've already generated back uh, millions of dollars to the local Boulder uh, nonprofit world. So it's it's pretty awesome. More than a billion dollars. Yeah, that is super impactful. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you for uh, providing a little bit of detail around that. Um, Seth also serves with me on a board of something called Startup Colorado, which I know because it's housed here at Silicon Flatirons. And I think it's doing really interesting, impactful work to support entrepreneurs in rural parts of Colorado. Um, so um, now along with Elizabeth is also, Seth is also, the co-author of The New Builders. Please help me welcome Seth Levine. I'd love to get this one, Pledge 1%. Pledge1%.org Pledge 1 if, you're, if you're interested in learning more. Um, so we're going to do some Q&A, but we mm -hmm. thought we would just sort of kick off and talk about it. Why don't you give the, I like the origin story because people are always asking like, yeah. and, and I, by the way, people are interested in like the, how do you write a book? It was. I, I am not a writer, I'm, I'm a blogger, which is not the same thing. <laughs> um, and we can talk about that later, maybe, but that, I always like the origin story. Our origin story is, yeah. surpri is surprising, <laughs> it's surprising, yeah, yeah. So people ask us how we met, um, and the answer is that in 2016, I was doing some work for the United Nations. I was a writing fellow for the Office of the Quartet, which is a body under the United Nations that works on the peace process between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and I was working on how do we make the Palestinian economy stronger. And as part of that was writing about entrepreneurs. And one of the entrepreneurs I met, um, young, you know, young man who had a, he was 
American actually had moved back to Ramallah to, um, to work on his company. And uh, he said, you've got to meet, he said, this crazy American investor who is investing <laughs> and supporting Palestinian um, entrepreneurs. And so I thought, he wasn't well, available, but you did find me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, huh, that is un it's surprising um, that such a thing exists. And so um, I, that's how we connected. So I heard about Seth that way. And then over the years, um, we, uh, so. You sent me some of your work, right? And said, hey, I'm interested in talking yes. to you about this. And, and uh, the moral of the story is really like being open to random random introductions like that That's right. we, we met and spent years sort of developing a relationship we did and uh whenever i was around in boulder doing work for this or that i would just drop by and see seth and on one of those trips we were sitting in his office i remember it very well um and i was telling him about oh the business actually times of entrepreneurship like how am i gonna what's the business model for it? how am i gonna do it and um, that's when we came up with the idea for the book and and i will hand it over to seth to say that was the idea of the book. That's our origin story. Um, and then the book evolved also in a very, I think both Seth and I are just that deeply into that, right? Yeah, it happened really quickly. I will say, if you want to write a book, because who doesn't want to write a book? Everyone's like, hey, I'm going to write a book one day. The way to do it is to actually say to someone else, like, hey, let's write it together. And then you, and if they're motivated and you're motivated, you kind of hold each other. Like, I've written parts of a bunch of books already, <laughs> none of which, like, managed to be, like, a full book. So it turns out a full book's, like, hundred and something thousand words, it's, like, a lot of words, right? Um, and so, you know, you get, like, 20,000 words in, and you're, like, pretty much said everything I'm going to say. And, like, that's a pamphlet, not a book. <laughs> and, so, and it's not, like, 1805, and so you can't publish pamphlets anymore. Right. So you're, like, okay, what's the next idea, right? Um, so we thought we were writing a very lighthearted book. This, so this was, we came together with this idea in 2019, um, and we thought, we had always traded stories about entrepreneurs that were a little outside of the mainstream eye that were doing things, either the type of business that they were building or the type of person that they were, um, was just different, right? And a lot of these were international entrepreneurs. I was started with this sort of shared interest in this like thriving entrepreneur ecosystem that's Palestine, uh, which both of us are still super active in. Um, and we would trade these stories. And so we thought, well, let's put these into a book and we we're gonna call it Faces of Entrepreneurship. And we sort of thought it was gonna be like a coffee table book. like picture of interesting entrepreneur, like tell his or her story, like, you know, next chapter, picture of, not, of a different entrepreneur, tell his or her story. And so we started as one does, or as Elizabeth taught me, you like start doing research. And so we started talking, not, we talked to some entrepreneurs, and then we started talking to some professors that studied entrepreneurship of, of whom there are very few, like entrepreneurship as a like academic discipline, it's taught in a lot of places, but as like a write papers that study entrepreneurship, it's not really a thing. Um, and so there were a couple of professors that do this. We started talking to them and then we started getting data from the SBA, SBA and started kind of digging through stuff. And we had this sort of aha moment at some point in, I don't know, the middle of 2019. We were like, wow, entrepreneurship's dying in the United States. Like there's a story here that we didn't realize. For starters, we, we, we didn't discover it, but we discovered for ourselves because we didn't know it, um, that the people that are starting businesses today are not the people that you read about. They're not white men. They're women more than men, and they are uh, women, they're people of color more than uh, white people. And specifically, black women are the fastest growing demographic of new business owners in the United States. Um, totally unknown, right? I had no idea. I mean, I knew that entrepreneurship was getting more diverse. We both shared these stories and thought, well, we should tell the story that entrepreneurship is getting more diverse. We had no idea that that was actually what we were writing about. Um, and, and it occurred to us that if we didn't know that and we'd spent some time thinking about it, that uh, the people that we knew probably didn't know about that. So we actually would go to some friends and say, hey, it turns out entrepreneurship's dying in the United States and uh, the people that are starting businesses are totally not the people that you think. And here's some reasons why you know, we need to do better connecting those people to capital. And the most common thing we got uh, in response was, well, that's not right. Not like <laughs> that's a shame, not right. Like that your data are wrong, like you are wrong. <laughs> and we would show them the data and they'd be like, uh, no, I just, no, I don't see it. Like everything I read, and especially my friends in venture capital, like we're killing it. Venture capital is crazy. This is 20. I mean, imagine telling them this today when venture is even more crazy. Um, but this was 2019 and it was still pretty crazy. And they were like, no, you got it wrong. And so we, we decided like we really need to write this book. 
I'll yeah. let you take it over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it had all kinds of implications, right? Um, because I think what, what bothered both of us um, is this idea that when we have this bad misperception about um, the whole body of entrepreneurship is thriving, when it's actually only thriving for a tiny slice, only 1% of startups in the U.S. get venture capital, and 99% are not thriving, right? And really, um, probably some of the 50% are really struggling, right? So when we have that misperception, it just, it screws everything up, right? And then you, we started to see policy decisions in Washington that were being made um, that were misguided because they were talking about, let's do venture capital across the whole country. Um, and replicate it. Well, if we do that, what are we replicating? A system where only white men succeed. Um, so we started to, to think about that. And, and I think both of us felt a responsibility then to write the book um, and to push out the research that we found, which had really remained in this only uh, known by a few people. And part of that was also exploring why that was, right? Why the misperception was continuing So that's that is um, the myth of the white male founder. The, I remember so vividly. Remember, family. Elizabeth wrote that we were we had this like shared. You'd think there'd be like the super cool software for writing a book with someone. There's not. It's called Google Docs. <laughs> and, so we, and I remember it vividly because we we actually we had this like kind of shared. We had the shared drive with these various folders, and it was like the research folder. And then at some point we opened up a new folder and started like writing the book. And you so you write the book by writing like you know, open the book folder, and then you open that up, and it's totally blank, and you're like, oh. <laughs> you open up a doc, and you, and uh, interestingly, you don't type chapter one and whatever, you, it's like, we've already, we'd already written, like, the outline to it, so we knew the general chapters, and you write, like, chapter four, because that's where you want to start, and you're like, okay, chapter four, the whatever, history of entrepreneurship, or something like that. Anyway, there, one of the chapters, you wrote that line, the myth, the myth of my white, white male founder. I think that was actually in the treatment that we, we wrote like a, a book proposal to our, uh, first to shop for an agent, and then we got an agent, and then we used that to, to get a publisher. And you wrote that in there, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly the way we described it. Yeah. And so when, when we talked about- It made it to the book. <laughs> <laughs> Very little from our treatment actually made it into the book, but that did. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we should say the five main points of the book. Yeah. We, um, we usually, it is a very, um, it's, I, I mean, I like to think of it, and a lot of people have said to us that it's a very readable, um, but still serious book, right? This is a really it's serious book. really well-written, Elizabeth. Oh. <laughs> 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 we both love my, it. Both my mom and dad told me. <laughs> okay. And they hadn't even read it, so. <laughs> I have to say, my daughter, who's in the back of the room, that's my daughter, Quinn, who came with me on this trip. When we pulled up into the parking lot, she was like, well, I can probably help you with the slideshow you have to do this week. And then she said, but you know, I've never actually read the book. She's <laughs> <laughs> a little devastating. Cuts us really deep, Quinn. Four years. <laughs> uh, but let's see. So the five main points. The yes. five main points in the book, um, which I'm, really, I'm sort of spacing on them right now, right? Um, so you say Okay. It's funny because we haven't done that. We did like, we we've done like 150 podcasts and I did this radio thing this morning, but we haven't done this together in like yes. two weeks, which means we forget everything we used to say. Um, yeah. So, so for, actually before I say the my five key points, I want to say that like, I think we take the responsibility that we had of telling stories of people that aren't necessarily us, right? Elizabeth's a new builder. You know, I'm a privileged white guy, like I'm not. So we took that very seriously. And we have like fair game and have been asked a bunch of questions about like, are you co-opting those stories, right? Like what, and, and I guess, so I wanted to say that up front, we can still like get, get good questions about this. I'm not trying to cut the questions off on it. But like, we took it very um, seriously that we were telling stories of other people and that we were using our platform, our ability to, um, get a book contract and have the, you know, the privilege and time to write a book and then, you know, spend money marketing and all the other things that you do when you write a book. So it turns out writing books is not a way to make money. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think that's really important to say up front. So there's, there's five key themes of the, of the book. The first is that entrepreneurship, we've already talked about entrepreneurship in the United States is in a profound state of 
Um, this started about 40 years ago. It accelerated after the, uh, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. We'll talk about some of the reasons for that. Um, the net number of new businesses is declining. Um, at the same time, the average age of a business in the United States is increasing. So we're not getting, think of like entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial communities as this almost like a forest. Like you need a certain amount of death and rebirth in order to create a vibrant ecosystem. And, and that we're losing that in the United States and that's causing some really um, sort of pernicious challenges for us as a country that we'll talk about. Um, so that was, that's thing number one. Um, thing number two is that technology and venture capital is like eating the word entrepreneur um, in a way that is totally unfair and completely unreasonable. A hundred years ago, entrepreneur, and in the book, if you're interested, we kind of trace the epidemiological history of the word. Um, but it meant sort of anyone who was undertaking a, a, a new endeavor, right, to, to, to start a new business. Could have been a farrier, a, a blacksmith, uh, someone who was a corner shopkeeper. A midwife. A midwife. Actually, many of the early businesses were, uh, you know, midwifery, laundry service, other sort of parts of what were considered the shadow economy. It's actually part of why it was so hard to write that history chapter. Um, because a lot of things weren't counted back in the day, but those everyone is considered an entrepreneur today. And it's still, we trace this history, which is super interesting. Ronald Reagan basically recognized the power of the, of the word entrepreneur, um, as a diplomatic tool to try to contrast capitalism with communism. And so he co-opted the word entrepreneur, but when he did it, he narrowed it because he was really talking about Silicon Valley and this sort of, it was nascent back then versus back in the eighties, but this this sort of you know group of technology businesses that grew up around uh, the research parks and in, and in, in near Stanford University, and so he used it to kind of narrow the definition as a diplomatic tool, and we've kind of run with that, and that's a real problem. And a related challenge is that, and Brad uh, referenced this in his introduction, we've come to only think about businesses that are valuable as businesses that can scale. What's the next unicorn, right? And in, in our world, like the venture capital world, that's what people talk about. Um, and, you know, we, we were using the term camel. Someone used the term bee the other day, which I think is an even better word. Like, we need a lot of bees. Bees are more interconnected. They're in community. They have to work together in order to, to, to survive. Um, but our economy needs more bees. Um, they're maybe not as sexy. Um, they're actually real because unicorns, of course, don't exist. Um, but that's what our economy needs. And we, we've just, like, we've lost this idea that starting a business to to promote you know, economic well-being for your family or to create a life that you want to create or to be uh, in community in a way that you want to be in community is in and of itself powerful, especially collectively, but, e but individually as well. And we've lost that because all anyone ever talks about is what scale model, what, are you a unicorn or not, and all of that. And that, in, in my world, that's what you have to talk about because the economic model is so poor um, that you generate all your returns through such a small number of investments. Um, but when you're talking about economic development across a broad section of our economy, not a great model, which is why Elizabeth points out it's, it's such a challenge to get people in Washington to understand that like the solution to, to broad based economic development is not fund more, more venture capital. It's fund something totally different. I'll pause there. You can take the next. How many did I do? Three? I think you did three. Okay. Uh, and then I, the, I guess the last two, I mean, well, the next one is really the people starting businesses today are women and people of color. Um, and um, it's interesting, you know, as more data has come out from the pandemic, we've seen, first of all, that um, it, this, this is um, a point of clarity that people, that, we, that we should talk about a little bit. Because when we say entrepreneurship is dying, it doesn't mean that people aren't starting companies. Um, because there are a lot of entrepreneurial people in the economy. There's 60 million people um, working in the gig economy today. So our kind of, one of our theses in the book is that um, these are people who, if we had a better support system, more of them would go on to start formal companies. Um, and whether even if they didn't turn out to be employer businesses, they could easily turn out to be small economic engines, right? Because as law students, um, you'll know, you'll recognize this too, right? The relationship between employer and employees changing in ways um, so that you can be a contractor, right? And so there are many women who start companies that might have a network of very consistent contractors. They never get counted. They don't get counted in the data very well. Um, but so that's a really important thing 
to recognize the people starting businesses are different and the kinds of businesses they're starting are also different. And what's our last point? Community. Community. Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite point. Um, okay. Um, so the and the last theme of the book, and, and we write about this in the last chapter, is the idea that um, today's entrepreneurs, that the new builders are absolutely essential and critical to the communities that we all live in. Um, and we have, it seems, really moved away from recognizing, or we moved away from from the from recognizing the economic value of small businesses and businesses that don't fit the tech model. At the same time, we have kind of also lost the vision of the fact that that's how our communities thrive. That that these companies created by new builders are the places where people meet and talk, whether they're red or blue. Um, and they're really uh, the small business owners. We write about this a bit as well. Like tend to have a backbone, right? You've got if you're an entrepreneur and you started a business, if you're a new builder, especially if you're a woman-owned business, a person of color-owned business, you've got a lot of courage. And that means in the community, you're often playing a role that's about, okay, I, I'll be the one standing up at the city council meeting, right? Or I'll be the one that shows up for this economic development project that 20 years down the road will bear fruit. And what we found when we researched is that in many places where communities are still thriving, it's because they had a thriving small business sector. And that's our last key point. Let's tell a couple stories, because I think one of the things that I'm most proud of in the book is that we've tried to marry sort of data and facts with storytelling. And so we tell the stories of lots of new builders. And I, I, I often tell people when they're asking me about like the process of writing that like the thing that I learned the most from Elizabeth in writing the books, we, we sort of nominally split up like, hey, I'm going to work on chapter this, I'm going to work on chapter that. And we would, we, when we were writing, we would get together every um, Tuesday morning, we would Zoom together, and every Friday, kind of midday, we would Zoom together. And we just sort of check in, like, hey, what are you doing, what are you doing? And we didn't, but so we didn't, like, have the outline and be like, Seth's going to write this, Elizabeth's going to write that. But we just sort of be like, ah, oh, you know what, I feel like working on this chapter, or, you know, I got stuck on chapter five, do you think you could pick it up kind of thing. But one of the things I learned a lot from Elizabeth was just that the art of writing narrative, like storytelling. Um, because it didn't come, I just hadn't done it, and it, it didn't come as natural. And it's, I, I feel like that's such a powerful part of the book, because we really wanted to bring to life what new, what it meant to be a new builder. Which, who's your favorite, which, I want to say oh, favorite new so, builder. I know, I know. People, Someone ask to talk about. <laughs> People ask that, and I'm like, oh, it's like picking my favorite child, because I really... Um... Quinn, that's you, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and really, these are um, because we worked on the book for two years. They're people that we develop relationships with, right, over the course of the of the years. And I still check in on, and um, we meet sometimes on panel discussions because we invite them um, to talk with us. But maybe I'll just mention because he's right at the top of my mind, Isaac Collins, who I think is chapter two or three in the book, um, who is a Kansas City entrepreneur, um, a black man who um, went to. I can't remember where he went to school, but he went to school with an entrepreneurship program that was funded by a big real estate developer who wanted to, to pass on entrepreneurial values. And that is a beautiful thing about the entrepreneurial community, right, that people really support each other in it. So um, the qualities of that community and when the doors get open to create access to other people, that is so powerful. Um, and what happened in that case is a white man uh, gave a ton of money to this small school, founded an entrepreneurship program. If you won a prize, um, then you um, got the money to open a Rocky Mountain chocolate factory franchise, right? <laughs> Not like the sexiest business in the world, um, but Isaac Collins, um, whose parents were both felons, um, uh, and he had grown up in kind of a rough neighborhood in Kansas City, but he won the prize, uh, he ran his franchise, he opened a second one, he sold them both. Now he owns three Yogurtini franchises in Kansas City and also runs um, a yoga class, a yoga guy. He runs a yoga class in um, four schools in his neighborhood. Um, and he's and he's just a, you know, just a stand-up part of his community when Black Lives Matter protests were going on. Uh, while well, he was right there on the front lines giving interviews, you know, where would Kansas City be without him? 
now. Um, so uh, he's one of my favorites. He's such a great guy. And he's starting an entrepreneurship coaching program. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. And he works in his bit right. I mean, this is the thing about new builders, right? And, and really, entrepreneurs everywhere. Like they work in their businesses. I and mean, he's we've got pictures of him in the, this, the middle section here. There's uh, some photos, and there's like pictures of him like loading cream into the <laughs> yogurt yogurt teeny machine thing. Um, I mean, that's what new builders do. So um, if I were to pick one, I'm trying to pick ones we haven't necessarily always talked about because there's some really powerful stories. We'll certainly talk about Janaris, the woman who started. Uh, a bake a very successful now bakery with thirty seven dollars in food stamps. If you think it's hard to, you know, start a business, imagine doing it with thirty seven dollars in food stamps. Um, that's bootstrapping in a different way. But but the one that I think I'll talk about um, is there's a uh, it's, this is chapter thirteen. You were right, it's chapter three. Actually, so. uh, and um, it was a group that came together to develop in a formerly redlined area in Oklahoma City. Um, and um, redlining, which is the practice of, of the informal, but totally and totally illegal practice of not loaning uh, to people in certain areas or from certain backgrounds, specifically black people. Uh, and it still persists and it's, it's, uh, it's invasive. Um, but uh, there was a project on the east side of Oklahoma City and there was a, a white developer who really wanted to make this project work. He came together with a, a black man who had a real estate background and had moved back, lived in a few different places and moved back to his, his uh, home city of Oklahoma City. And they partnered together. They found a uh, local banker, and we'll talk about community banks maybe later because they played a role in, in so many of the businesses that we talk about and they're very much in trouble right now. Um, they found a local banker who really believed in the project. And so they were able to get this project up and running all of the tenants are new builders. Almost all are, are not just people of color, but, but, but black people um, running their businesses out of this uh, new development. It's got a couple different phases um, and they're done with phase one, they're into phase two. And one of the interesting things is they developed a new model for these leases for their initial tenants and that effectively allow their tenants to earn equity stakes in the overall project. So they don't get gentrified out um, over time, the rents, have to stay a certain level, but then if they give up after 10 years, they give up their space, they actually get bought out and they get to participate in the upside of the project. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting model to help figure out how to get people who were there from the ground floor from the very beginning to, to participate in some of the value that they help create. Um, there's some great also pictures in the middle of the book um, of some of the tenants there. It's yeah, just, I, love that. I love that picture yeah. of, of all of them sitting together. It's really powerful. Did you go there? I didn't. I mean, I yeah, yeah, there. yeah, yeah, I had, yeah, yeah. Oklahoma City is really the front lines of the red blue conflict. Absolutely. And very, you know, this is all very close to the Tulsa race riot. Right, right, right. right. Um, all that history. Wall Street. Yeah, people are very aware um, there. And people work really hard um, to cross boundaries. What I saw and what I experienced, and a lot of it was I was I was just humbled, right, to have a, a group of Black um, entrepreneurs and community leaders like sit and, and be open. You know, I know that the white developer Jonathan Dodson. <laughs> there's this line in the book. His friend is sent. So it was Sandino Thompson and Jonathan Dodson who did the project, and Jonathan would come to Sandino and just say, "Oh my God, I feel so so guilty." I'm Sandino would just say, I just get over it, man. <laughs> just like move on, like just do, just do stuff, right? Lingering in your guilt and like professing all this doesn't do it. Anybody really. My favorite Sandino quote is he he at one point said to Jonathan, someday I'm gonna like you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you remembered that to tell us because he's like, that's perfect. So yeah, it's um, yeah. And the and Jill Castilla, who is also, I mean, if you check her out on Twitter. I, this is the banker who yes. leads in the project. And yes. they, they got turned down by, you know, umpteen number of other bankers. 25. Yeah. 25. And, the, and the, our original, the way I found that story, I was working at Georgetown and somebody said to me, there's these three white guys trying to get a project off the ground in Oklahoma City. And they've been turned down by 25 banks because it's in a red light district. And they had already gotten the city to put up money for the project. They had a long-term lease from a healthcare company, which is like golden, right, in real estate. They get like 25 bucks to them. Yeah. And, they, and a partial backer to the loan, And right? a partial backer yeah. to the loan. They had all of that yeah. in place, got turned down. Um, and then finally, a community banker from another town 
Jill Christina is her name. Who's kind of a nationally uh, recognized woman banker? Um, stepped up and said, "We'll do it." So, yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of stories like that. We won't tell all of them because then you wouldn't need to read the book. Right. But, um, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe we should open it to questions. Questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll exercise the moderator's prerogative with a couple questions, and we'll we'll just make this uh, a group discussion. Um, we'd like to come back a couple to see the key points and go a little bit um, starting with the the decline of entrepreneurship. Um, in your estimation, you know, however you want to segment uh, entrepreneurs, whether it's along ethnic, gender lines, um, type of company, you know, scalable lifestyle. Um, where did you find the, the biggest areas of decline in concern versus what parts of American entrepreneurship in the data look fairly healthy to you? I'll start with that. Um, uh, so the, the biggest declines, and this is pandemic related, are in women-owned people of color businesses, right? They were just disproportionately hit um, in the pandemic because they had so little cash reserves. And if you think about uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has done some great work. Um, I, I think when the pandemic hit, like the vast majority of businesses in poor communities had like three weeks of cash reserves. I mean, just nothing. So, you know, those months long shut shutdowns, they just killed those businesses. And those are not, those are not stories that like the awareness of that kind of slaughter of small businesses, just there's no way to write that enough, right? As a writer, you cannot tell a million of those stories, but that's actually what happens that we lost a bunch of those businesses. And that's a big loss. Yeah, but the truth is the loss is really across sort of all, call them Main Street, I don't literally mean Main Street, I mean in part literally Main Street, but also, you know, office parks. But there's, the loss is, is essentially ubiquitous across those businesses. Um, the number of stores that are opening today that are another store, another storefront of an existing company versus a brand new store is like twice what it was in the late 70s, as an example. I talked about the average age of a business increasing this because there's less, there are fewer small or newer businesses that are being started in the first place. It's really, it's really um, troubling. And you know, one of the challenges is access to capital. And if there's a theme of the book, it is Capitalists still look like me, new builders are new builders, we don't do a good job of connecting the two. So while venture might be on fire, venture has its own massive challenges with funding people that are not white and male, um, and maybe getting a little better, but still like has a long, long way to go. But, but in the world more broadly, um, we do a terrible job at getting capital to new builder businesses. And um, Elizabeth mentioned 1% of companies take money from venture capitalists. Only about 17% of companies take money from banks. Banks have their own challenges. Women and people of color are uh, more li likely to get turned down from a, for a loan. They apply for smaller amounts. They get approved for smaller amounts. They pay higher interest rates, and they're less likely to apply in the first place. So that's a problem on the loan side. And then you've got this 82% in the middle that have to kind of figure it out themselves. One of the reasons that uh, new business starts went down so precipitously after the Great Recession is because one of the ways people fund businesses is they use a home equity line that wasn't available to people when their house values went down. But more troubling and more problematic is the wealth of the average black family is one tenth the wealth of the average white family. The wealth of the average Hispanic family is one seventh the wealth of the average white family. All of this is absolutely still true, even when you control for educational attainment of head of household or income of head of, head of household. So we're talking about what happens when you have a system that is racially rigged for hundreds and hundreds of years, even if you're making good money, you're still, you still don't have the family wealth that, that, uh, that, you, that white people do. Um, and so all of that makes it harder for people of color to start businesses, which is why those businesses, as Elizabeth described, have less capital. And one of the things that I think is really important and is, is there's a conclusion that we heard over and over, which is that women and people of color are less successful businesses because their businesses do fail at a higher rate than those started by white male businesses. And our response, which is, which is by the way, proven by the data is because they have less fucking money, right? Like it, it's not a causation, it's a correlation between, between white men starting businesses being successful. 
there is a correlation there. It's not caused by their whiteness. <laughs> it's caused by their moneyness. Um, and it just, I'm, I'm getting heated because it's so frustrating to have heard this so many times and I have debated it so many times. Um, one of the uh, people that we talk about in the book is a woman from Denver who started a network of black women helping each other out. It's called Sister Biz. She said something to us the other day. I wish she'd said it a while ago because she would have paid the book because I've said it every, every time we've gotten up front of the group since then. She said, when you give someone a small amount of money, you force them to think, think small. So you give someone a little bit of money and they have to think about payroll or small marketing dollars. When you give someone a large amount of money, you free their mind to think about things, in, you know, think about bigger things, bigger things. And it's absolutely true. I'd like to come back to some of the capital challenges. Um, let me propose some other possible explanations for challenges for uh, women entrepreneurs, especially women of color entrepreneurs, and see if this sounds like factors as well. Um, is there educational challenges that underlies some of the trend lines? Um, and then across a number of sectors, we've seen social capital, which is by and large defined by uh, a writer named Robert Putnam that, that some of you may be familiar with as a, a level of trust within society. And across a number of, of metrics, so goes the argument we've seen social capital deteriorate in the United States. Um, are these additional factors, as well as, I guess, technology trends? You know, the ability to do more in software, and, and just as a classic matter, uh, it uh, takes five people at YouTube to, to disrupt an entire industry, right? So as you think about, okay, we'll, we'll put up capital, we'll come back. How about some of these other factors, such as education, access, the way it works, social capital, and technology as drivers. Are, are these concerns as well or not? Well, education, not so much for me. From my knowledge from these 30 years of writing about um, startups and small businesses of all kinds, I mean, what I've seen is that in some very technical businesses, education matters. Um, but mostly entrepreneurship is like, a lot of courage it's, it's and being open-minded and continuing to learn actually because it doesn't what you know at the beginning is not that important it's your willingness to keep learning and keep adapting your business and that is not I think a factor of education so that's what I would say there um, the social capital is huge though um, and it's interesting because I do think that there's a ton of social capital in the worlds of entrepreneurship, uh, people of color and women, I think they're both of those groups are, are very good at forming networks and, and creating social capital, but it's not exactly the same. It's like men are um, taught from very early ages to do a certain kind of social capital. I think about this a ton, right? I write about it. Um, I'm a fellow at MIT, right? I talk about it with the professors there sometimes. Um, but I think the, that men, the social capital men practice is very geared to a certain kind of success. Women have a different kind of social capital. People of color have another kind of social capital. And so there is, there's a big cultural difference there. And I don't know that it's about, I don't know if we want to change that, if we need to change that. Um, I just think it is, and it's one of the reasons that um, 94% of Fortune 500 CEOs are still men. Two more things to add to that. One is just another quote that sticks out in my mind. This one did make the book, which was, uh, uh, this was Catherine Finney, um, who's a longtime entrepreneur, black woman, a longtime entrepreneur, also started a uh, sort of an accelerator style business that was focused just on uh, Latina at, uh, women, Hispanic women, and uh, black women. And she said, basically, like, the U.S. has a 400-year history of not trusting black women. And that was interesting. And when you marry that up with the fact that the median amount of money raised by a black female founder in 2018 was zero, median amount was zero, um, that, like, it, it, it maps, right? I mean, that, that was, it was interesting to hear that. Um, and then I'll say something about that in a second that, that I think is relevant to many in this room. But um, I think one of the things that your comment, Elizabeth, made me think about is like, we, we don't, like our networks aren't as open as we think they 
part, right? We're not as meritocratous as we claim to be. Um, and that's been something that I have, I realized about myself, right? I mean, writing this book and I was like, oh, you know, I'm you know, super open and I know lots of people. And I was like, then I really looked at it and I was like, no, 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 like it's not, right? Like you think you are, but you're not. And one of the things that I think is important is how do you share your network with other people? And it turns out, and there's research on this, people tend to make, to share their networks with people that look like them. Men like to mentor men. And that, that, that's been studied extensively. Um, and I'm not, I, I say this cautiously because I, I'm not talking about like, well, go find, if you're a guy, go find a woman to mentor. If you're a woman, go find a guy to mentor. It's not that, or if like, if you're a woman, you have to mentor other women because the guys aren't doing it. it it's, I'm actually saying something a little bit different, which is like, I think we need to think differently about this. And the thing I'd say to all of you is, um, I've spent the last two and a half years in places where I was extraordinarily uncomfortable. Um, where I was the minority in the room, where I said stupid shit and got corrected for it, where um, I, it, like it was, a, it was hard and I realized that it's pretty easy, certainly in my world of venture capital, to spend my entire life around people that I, want something from me, money or time or whatever, and will we'll sort of, you know, kiss up about it and not be like, I never have to be uncomfortable. And I think a lot of people that I know actually live lives exactly like that. And I think that it is more rewarding, I guess this is what I'm trying to say to the group, like to actually put yourself out of that zone, right? To be in the room that you just described, or I was, I was at a thing recently with, where I was the only white person in the room and it was, a, it was a very interesting yet also uncomfortable conversation that I was in the middle of. And it was like an incredible privilege to be a part of that. I said this to, I was talking to a friend of mine who was in the room with me and I was saying, he was like, was that cool? Like, I, you know, kept looking at you like, are you cool with this? And I was like, George, it was like unbelievable to be able to be it treated as an equal in that room, even though obviously I'd had a different background than everyone else in the room. And of course they were all different too, right? It was a conversation related to like the experience of this group of black people who were united, born in the United States and raised here. And there were a handful of people that were in our group that were, um, were born and raised outside of the US. Um, specifically in Jamaica, and they were talking about sort of these, these differences. And anyway, the specifics aren't, aren't important, but like this idea of like putting yourself out there and being open to being uncomfortable, um, I think that is, if there's any takeaway from this, I would encourage you, I would, I would hope it would be that. Like there's so much value in this being in uncomfortable positions and being in uncomfortable places. And I've, what I've found is that people have been incredibly receptive because I've spent way more time in the last two years talking to people who don't look like me than I do talking to people like me, because I've been trying to do as little of my job as possible to do as much of this as I can possibly do. Um, and I'm trying to bring those two things together, actually, and, and have more people in my day job world of venture capital not look like me. And I, we can talk about whether we've done a good job of that, but we've certainly done a better job of that. Um, but it's been really rewarding, and I would encourage you to do it. And it's not that hard to start finding people in network. Like that's and everyone in this room knows how to network. Like you're all in law school, and and you're all you're all uh, capable of doing that. I would just encourage you to think about ways to do that in ways that expand your network. And if you're not uncomfortable, you're not doing it right. Oh, good. Oh, I just want to ask you, like, what is behind that question about social capital, social network? Um, just to make sure that everyone's baseline to this, a good example that Putnam has is um, the decline in bowling leagues <laughs> as a measure of social capital. Uh, he's got a book called Bowling Alone, um, and, and it's a measure of are we out in the community? So you can look across a number of institutions where people used to get together with people that they might look to similar, have some similar element, but there's a community activity. So for example, church going in the United States down dramatically. Uh, activity in fraternal organizations down dramatically. So all those things are out there. Um, and one of the interesting things with respect to uh, the startup community, at least as we've defined it in Boulder here for the last 15 years, which is decidedly scalable company oriented, right? Um, is within that subgroup, there is enormous social capital. And if anything, that social capital in my estimation has gone up over the last 15 years. Um, and that start that stands in you know contrast to many other walks of life, where I think people feel increasingly isolated, that they lack resources and support, 
uh, at least relative to past generations. And it's a real challenge if you're not in a community that has high degree of social capital, where do you go for help? sure about that, right? I'm not so sure that that the social capital that exists in new builders communities is not just as powerful. I really think now that we're kind of digging through this, I really think it's money. I just think it's money. Because I mean look at the social capital they had in Oklahoma City or look at the the social capital they had in Stanford, Virginia, or many of the examples in our book, right? It doesn't it's not it's not, it, it doesn't look the same as the capital you're talking about. It looks different, but it exists. Um, so I think it's just a question of getting money and, and some protective laws. We heard right about that a bit in the book too. Um, and, may, and some element potentially of education, right? I do, there is, there is part of that in there as well. Um, but yeah, I just think there's so much social capital and I think it's actually thriving in the immigrant communities, right? I here is from an immigrant community. I mean, those are so tight knit, right? That's one of the places entrepreneurship is still thriving in the US. If you haven't seen it, a plug for a documentary called The Donut King, which is awesome. <laughs> I'll just leave Who's that. the entrepreneur? Uh, it's a Cambodian immigrant who sort of set forth. Yeah. If you ever go to Southern California, you're like, why is there five donut shops for everyone in Boulder? The Donut King will answer that question for you. It's, it's a fabulous story of the Cambodian community. Um, I've got pages of questions, but I'm going to ask one more, and then we're going to open it up, and we'll follow the Silicon Platter's policy of a first question to a student, um, and then we'll just open up for a general conversation. Policy prescriptions, including capital. What are the two or three most important steps that you think need to be taken to address the decline in entrepreneurship, especially among women of color? Yeah, a couple. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We're working on a couple right. also right now, right. so maybe some of this will actually happen. Yeah, there, there's so there's a broad, you know, right now. So I'll give you number one. So we um, wrote an article in Times of Entrepreneurship in the past month about state entrepreneur state sort of startup programs and look city startup programs, um, and it turns out that um, to this is one example, but it's representative. Um, there is a city, a state in the middle of the U.S. where if you are a high-tech founder, who are obviously mostly white men, um, if you can get half a million dollars, if you have, uh, if you fill out a four-page application and you have an idea that can be patent protected, that's your application process. The application process, if you are a new builder starting a new business, is 16 pages long, character references, a credit check, and then you get $50,000. So that's one policy prescription I'd say right away, is that like there's $10 billion in our federal budget now flowing toward these local programs across the country. And if we do not fix that inequity, all of that money is going to shoot right into those high-tech spots, and that's going to go almost entirely to white men. And that's just what's going to happen because it'll be much easier. So that's my hope. Certainly is sexier. I've got a couple of couple of thoughts. Um, one is something that we did really well here in Colorado, which is called Energize Colorado, um, and we created this thing called the called the Gap Fund, which was a fund to to fund primarily new builder uh, style businesses. Um, and we're actually working on trying to get that national, so Energize America <laughs> and American Gap Fund. So I think that would be a great way, and it. it be a policy way because we need we need the government resources to do that. Another is um, there we talk about a number of public private partnerships in the book that are community loan funds. Community loan funds do an incredible job of getting money to uh, new builder businesses that um, and then also getting technical assistance to new build, assistance to new builder businesses. I'm actually I've been working. I'm on a something something group with the SBA that's trying to think about how do we maybe fund the technical assistance side of that through the SBA. Um, and then tax credits for investors in local communities to fund those uh, funds. There are a number of really good examples in New Hampshire Community Loan Fund in particular comes to mind. Um, so that's, that's uh, thing three. And then the last thing, we haven't really talked about the decline of banking in the United States yet, but it's, it is like crazy. 
Uh, 20 years ago, there were 14,000 banks in the U.S. Today, there are fewer than 4,500. The book's actually already out of date. We say 4,800 in the book. Um, what were those numbers one more time? There, 20 years ago, 14,000 banks. Today, there are fewer than 4,500. 4,800 is reported in the book, so it's declined since we, in fact, I should probably look it up again because I looked it up a couple months ago. It's probably even lower. Um, most of that decline has come at the, the larger end, or sorry, the smaller end of the banking system. The large banks now control the four biggest uh, banks in the country, control 80% of U.S. deposits. So it's the community banks. Community banks, right? right? So yeah. we are, so the other thing I'm trying to work on is a couple of different programs that would provide more funding, more incentive for people to open accounts at the community banks, right? Including, um, including community banks, uh, at, like deposit uh, in a community bank as part of like the opportunity to zone opportunity zone program so like you can take a capital gain from somewhere else you can invest it in an opportunity zone right now and you get to defer the gains on that uh, on that income um i i'm working with this actually may end up happening I'm, i've actually got like a congressman i'm working with on this um but try to get uh opening a money market uh or a savings account um at a community bank to qualify same same thing you'd have to keep it there for a certain period of time the reason that's so important one Community banks do a much better job of lending new builders. Two, they do a much better job of sort of underwriting. They're not as algorithmic as the big banks. Algorithms that run bank, banking decision making, as we referred to earlier, tend to be biased in their decision making. Well, not tend to be, they are biased in their decision making. Um, and community banks can kind of push through that because they have more of a, a person to person underwriting model. Um, and then lastly, there's a 10x multiplier on a dollar that's deposited in a community bank, it gets loaned out 10 times. Um, so it's incredibly effective. This is the pitch I was making to the government. Like, you know, you, you get $100 million put into uh, community banks through this program, you're providing uh, a deferral on, you know, something like $25 million worth of tax credits, and you're creating a billion dollars worth of loans. Like, that's a pretty, to me, that's pretty compelling. Um, it's amazing how hard it is to work through the, the halls of Congress, even when you can get the congressman on the phone. But, um, but you know, maybe it'll happen. But that's the, that's the math, right? I mean, that's, that's why it's so powerful. All right, Terry, let's open up for questions. Go ahead. Hi, um, I just want to thank you both. My name is Amy Gillespie. I'm an MBA student here, um, but I'm also taking a VC law class, so learning about the VC community. I have had um, the opportunity to talk with different VCs and entrepreneurs about a lot of things, but specifically the thing I'm most interested in is exactly what you guys are talking about. And the first thing I want to say is, one, thank you. I do think that white men in VC need to be having the conversation, writing books, having conversations personally in order to make this, like, reveal that this is a major problem and that it doesn't come from women entrepreneurs. But there was something that um, I was looking into last year, which was that, you know, VC investment in women looked like it was 2.8% in 2019, and it dropped to 2.3%. Black and Latinx women received less than 1%. And when I had the opportunity to talk to people in the community, we, I keep hearing the phrase, this is a pipeline, pipeline problem, and I don't know it's if it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because when I talk to other women and people of color entrepreneurs, we know that it's bullshit. But then we talked to the VC community. There was this person that I, I was able to hear from who was talking about their billions and, and talking about how great they were as a person in this community and also minimized this problem like to no end. And it drove me bonkers. So being here is like reinflating a de deflated person. <laughs> so thank you for that. We're going to get to that part later. So. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, you know, what is your reaction to the pipeline problem? And I know we're talking about new builders, which is slightly different, I think, from maybe VC backable, black people of color, women entrepreneurs. But it's not too far a leap to see that 2.3%, less than 1%, something's wrong there. And what are the solutions other than there's this pipeline problem? So um, I, think it's, I think it's really related, actually, um, because because I think that it comes down to much less, well, uh, let me just start by saying, I learned, I think, the most from a woman venture capitalist, and I wrote about her on Forbes like a few months ago, and she had, she's studying this problem, right? She looked at her own portfolio and realized at some point that it was only, you know, 10% women or something, which was higher than typical, but she was like, wow, I'm a woman, she's um, Asian, she's a person of color, so she's like, what? 
this is crazy. And she started to really dig into it. Um, part of it is, and this is where, in all fairness, you can't say a, a white male venture capitalist is a pipeline problem exists to some extent because women do start different companies, right? And that, they start different kinds of companies. The stats show women care more about community and impact, and all those things can be potentially a drag on the scale piece that venture capitalists look for so hard, right? Um, so there is that tinge of truth, and usually when there's bullshit in the room, there is a tinge of truth to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how the patriarchy still exists. Well, I think that's true, but I'd also say, and I say this frequently to uh, my white male counterparts in venture, many of whom were not excited about the book, right, because they don't like getting called out on their, on their bullshit, um, is when you say it's a pipeline problem, you're externalizing it. But what it actually is is a network problem, and that's your problem. So if you want to fix the pipeline, then you need to change your network because there's plenty of great businesses out there. And I can just tell you, having experienced this personally, because I would have said five years ago or even three years ago, I've got a pretty good network. I'm just not, you know, I guess I'm just not seeing these businesses. Um, and that was just, you know, blinders on wrong, right? And so, you know, at Foundry, we've done some things to change that pretty significantly. The change happens over time because it just takes a little bit of time. But we, we actually raised a pool of capital explicitly. So we've got a slightly different model. So we invested in funds and then we invest in companies from those funds. Um, but we, we raised a, a pool of capital that was earmarked to only invest in funds that were run by women and people of color. Um, and really, essentially, all of the last 12 fund investments that we've made, we, we don't like publicize this super loudly um, at Foundry, but they've all been in, in uh, partnerships that are primarily um, non, not white male. Um, and the result of that has been that more of the things we are seeing um, are, I'm thinking about the last like three or four things we've done have been led by, at least co-led, in one case it's a, a husband and wife, he's a black man, she is female, obviously, but not uh, a person of color. Um, but another black man, I, the thing I looked at today was led by a Hispanic man. Like, I think we're, I think it's changing, but the numbers in total aren't changing. Now, some of that is part of what we're seeing is a huge amount of money going into later stage businesses that are led, that are established and are already led by white men. That doesn't change the fact that the percentages are off, but I do think we should look at, you kind of have to look at, at the businesses in their earlier stages, because that's what's getting funded new as opposed to the follow-ons. And I think it's getting a little bit better, but still, I'm not, I'm not minimizing what you're describing, because I think that most of my colleagues are, would say there's a pipeline problem, and I think, I think that's bullshit. Thank you. Gabriel. Hi, my name is Gabriel Rudin. I'm a law student here at CU. Thank you both for your time. This is a fascinating book, and I appreciate uh, you sharing it with us. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is if you take as, as the thesis of this book or from this conversation at least seems to be is that if you look at entrepreneurship as uh, a proxy indicator for like the health of the country and just our innovative capacity, right? A lot of that seems to be stymied by the fact that a lot of the economic and political apparatus of the United States seems to be that of an oligarchy, right? You look at our political uh, candidates or just who our congressmen are, it's a gerontocracy, right? And if you look at uh, the locus of power that's wealth, it happens to map on well to the contours of race and gender, which is white men being in power. And one of the distrust elements that you've talked about is seeing that those who have money are having a hard time looking at investing in just like discrete and insular communities of minority communities as no longer being a, a wealth transfer, but actually a wealth creation process. So are you indirectly making a case for reparations in some manner? <laughs> um, no, I don't think that we went that far in the book. Um, but, no, although we probably right, have views on right. it. <laughs> <laughs> we do have views on that. I was actually thinking, um, I was actually thinking yesterday that I might write a piece saying, why shouldn't women get reparations too? I'm just gonna throw it out there, right? All the unpaid, we're looking at this paid leave thing that's dying on the hill in Washington now, why are we not grappling with the fact that the work that parents do, that mostly mothers do, should be compensated? It's because it's too big, right? 
which is the reason we haven't ever given reparations for slavery either. It's because they're just, it's too big, and the people with the money aren't going to give away 90% of it. They're just not going to do it. Um, so am I making a case for reparations? I don't know. What I would say is that we're not going to see change in these social structures until enough women and people of color get to be in those positions of power. We're just, that's the only way that the, the norms and the understanding is going to grow enough to really open up access. So when I think about like how I make change in my life, it's about um, doing everything I can to promote other women and people of color in every way I can. Right? That's why I founded the news company that I operate and why I consciously look and see, okay, who am I quoting? Because it's so easy to quote. When I run a story where I'm writing about a woman entrepreneur, the traffic is lower than when I write about a man entrepreneur, a male entrepreneur. And that's because our brains are trained to see men as the center of stories. Like overcoming this stuff is deep and hard. I'd say reparations is like a flashy like thing. If somebody else wants to take it on, I'd probably support it. But the changes I make in my own life are smaller and deeper. But I think they're the changes that need to be made. I mean, fundamentally, we're talking about getting more money to more new builders. And so sort of however that happens, and by the way, we saw this happen over the last, whatever, six months. There's an Upshot article a few months ago that was sort of asking the question, like, were people taking their, uh, their, their tax credit money or their tax rebate money and using it to start businesses? This is the you know, $1,200 a family or whatever it was. Um, and, and of course, the answer was, well, yes, right? And so if that's what happens when you give someone $1,200, right? Imagine what happens if you give, and that, that was sort of like, you know, uh, Get, trying to get a glass of water by holding out your glass in the rain, right? Like, you know, if you could have a more directed uh, funnel of money to people that were, were ready to start businesses, and it was $10,000 or $50,000 or $100,000, that would make a, even a bigger difference. So this is, a, this is my question, not someone online. Um, but we've talked a little bit about how venture isn't necessarily giving the money to women-owned businesses and... Um, businesses owned by people of color for various reasons. Um, I think one of the points you hinted on is that these aren't necessarily as venture scalable as you know some of the other businesses that are being come up with. Does this mean, like, how do you get more funding? Does this mean venture changes its model? Or does this mean we come up with new models? Yeah, it's something we, we've talked about, we grapple with, and there are people within venture trying to like change the venture business model in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. Um, and then there are people experimenting. Um, and what we've talked about is, like, how do you create a scalable business that would loan in those smaller increments? Um, so I think the answer is both. I think we need every kind of new model that we can get. Um, yeah, that's what I think. So in particular, so one, I'd say that there's plenty of people of color who started businesses that are venture backable and we need to do a better job of funding them and, and women. Um, two, um, I don't think the answer is to change the venture model. 66% of venture dollars or venture investments uh, fail to return the capital that was invested at least round by round. Um, so it's a model that relies on these huge outcomes. Um, I think the more interesting thing is to think about different models. There's some capital, venture capital adjacent models, RBI or RBF, which is revenue-based investment, revenue-based financing. Um, Collab Capital is a great example of, happens to also be run by a team of black men and women, uh, but a great example of a new capital model. They raised $50 million uh, to fund uh, all sorts of types of businesses with this model. They don't require those businesses to to reach crazy scale because it's a different return method. So um, just to be clear, when you say this model, do you mean a revenue-based revenue model? Revenue-based model, okay. yeah. So just uh, maybe I'll pause for a second, do the professor thing, and I'll get you the sure. microphone back. So for those that are not familiar with this, the, the classic model of venture-style investing is Seth and Foundry Group will get excited about what Elizabeth's doing, and they will take convertible preferred stock that they will then hold usually until Elizabeth either sells her company or rarely, but it happens, takes it public, right? And that's the return model. Well, that works for a scalable company that's playing in billion dollar markets, 
but it's not particularly well suited for the new builders, right? The, the company that's trying to do a bakery or something very community oriented. And what Seth's saying is um, new models that are revenue based investing doesn't, they're not, the return's not predicated on the big sale of the company at the end of the day. You can imagine a company that chugs along, turns off revenues, and pays back set five to seven percent per year up to say three x of the investment. So anyway, just that's my moment. Go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor. For <laughs> <there. Yeah. laughs> uh, so uh, so those are interesting models. I, you know, that's like so one percent of companies venture like there's you know we're like on this side still. I don't know if that's five, ten, fifteen. You know, still something on that side of the world. What we've been thinking about, and I've been like you know spare time trying to find some people to work on this with me, but like. I believe that there's a different underwriting model to underwrite businesses for ten dollars to $50,000 at a pop that's fast, easy, and profitable, um, because really that's like a trillion dollar challenge in the middle. And so that can't be PRI money or uh, in impact money or whatever you want to call it. It has to be something that ends up being wildly profitable. And I think that, that um, I mean, if, I were, if I were an MBA student right now and not old and whatever, like I, I, this is what I would be trying to do, like build that company and what you'll do great for the world. And I think it'll be incredibly successful. And I'd like it to be a for-profit, like wildly profitable, successful business. And what I so. would do is actually call it a venture capital company and take over the definition of venture capital. Because <laughs> <laughs> why should white men own the definition yeah. of venture and capital? Yeah, there you go. Can, can I draw on that idea and I'll, we'll come back to you a second. So um, many of you in the community are familiar with Techstars which um, began in 2007, was one of the two early pioneering accelerators. And it, it's in many respects, a scattering of investment across an index fund. So this year, Techstars is gonna do new investments in 700 different companies worldwide. Uh, it's not willy-nilly because you've gotta get admitted. So there's some best and brightest sort of vetting going on, but it is a really dramatic like scattering uh, of interest. And it seems to have returned well is that what you're saying that you would do a Techstars style index fund for the middle where you're getting a lot of bets down? And if so, what sort of additional training or betting would you do that still uh, makes it accessible, but tries to make it so it's likely to have favorable returns yeah. for the new no, builders? No, because Techstars is just a venture model as an accelerator. Nothing wrong with it, right? We're the biggest investors in Techstars. Well, it's much more uh, um, dramatically democratic than traditional VC models in yeah, terms of I don't, I don't number know of investments, I'm, you know, in and out, you're in for three months and released. So yes, there are, it's prolific in the sense that there's 700 companies, but it's still basically the venture model, not basically, it's still the venture model, okay. right? So what I'm talking about is not that. Although I think there are, that we talk about E for Entrepreneurship for All, which is a program that is Techstars like, that works with new builder businesses, right? There's a E for All in Longmont, uh, if you're interested, let me know. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a business that is essentially creates a, some sort of loan fund at massive scale that um, is able to loan money to people that are trying to start or scale their business um, using not the FICO score underwriting model, something else, um, which we have, we've actually been brainstorming what those inputs would be, but uses something else and then gets capital to these new builders at a scale that is much greater than, I mean, Collab, which like, you know, was, I mean, $50 million for a PR or for a RBI fund was a huge achievement and they were oversubscribed and whatever. And, 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 you know, it was, it was, it's great that they did that. It's $50 million, right? I mean, it's Foundry manages $3 billion alone from Boulder with like seven people, right? I mean, it's just not the same scale. And so, I hope it's incredibly successful because I'd love, you know, we started with something less than three billion and it took us a while to get there. So I hope it's successful, but I, I, I think in order to be successful on a national scale, it's gotta be something else. It's gotta be its own thing, which is what I'm describing. We call it venture capital, that's fine. But, um, but part of why I don't is because I want to attract a, a series of investors who don't view it as, as risky, right? I want it to produce a, a return that is, you know, five to 8% year in and year out. I think if you can figure out how to get money in those increments to, to new builders um, and, and do it with that kind of return, so you'd have unlimited upside. It's so interesting because you have to think about like what, what do investors really, like what does the money really want? Do, are they attracted by the flashy returns, which is what I think venture capital stands for in people's minds, although it's not true. I mean, it's because so many funds don't deliver, right? 
Um, but or, I mean, we're at CU. CU is getting sued right now by a major donor who is pissed that CU's foundation or uh, endowment wasn't in more venture. Right. Right, because right, the returns they, were crazy right, the last couple. Right, of years. they want right. So, so yeah. if we're going to attract capital. That's why I think we should call it venture capital. So we got to. We have to. You have to make people believe there's high return. That's all. I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we're working this out, right? <laughs> We've got some securities and lawyers here. Who have well, it sounds like what we need is a marketing <laughs> MBA. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my name is Dustin. I'm, uh, I co-founded a software company from CU that's making software for crane companies and construction companies. Um, and one thing that uh, we've talked about a little bit, both my co-founders are immigrants. Uh, Satsim's from India, Linda's from El Salvador. Uh, and one thing we have kind of acknowledged is that that adds inherent risk to our company um, because you know nobody comes from generational wealth. Um, and you know there are immigration challenges as well, which also require more capital to overcome because of the regulation in this country. Um, and we've started engaging with investors, and it's it, we don't know how to talk about that, and whether we even should. Um, if we don't, are we going to get screwed? And if we do, are we going to say, is it going to scare them off? Because they're, they're all white men. Would a fine point on it. Are there concerns about visa issues going forward after they, they leave school, for example? Is that yeah, part of the risk? Visa and just like having any sort of family wealth. Yeah. A couple of chapters. We actually talk about a venture fund. The untrackled venture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there, oh, there are solutions. I don't know. My, my advice is pitch to immigrant VCs. That's my advice. And I think women should pitch to women, venture capitalists. And I, I, I think you're just, you're way more likely to get uh, where you're going. But there are also, just looking up, there's a, a, a group called uh, Unshackled Ventures, which actually specializes in supporting entrepreneurs through those visa issues. Um, and I don't know, on the wealth, I mean, on the gener generational wealth thing, you know, you are who you are, right? You have to own it. Like when people tell us to go back and raise a family and friends round. Oh my god. Like, <laughs> like, like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just I would ignore that and just go raise you. I mean if you think you have a scalable business that's fundable by venture capitalists, and I would go raise. There's lots of seed funds right around and, and you know, I think these days, I mean if anything's changed in the, I mean lots of things changed the twenty years since I've been a venture capital, but but there's a lot more access to seed, which allows people to skip the friends and family stage. You asked about policy, though, like a policy that is, I think, is a no-brainer. I don't know why we don't do this. I would staple a green card to every diploma in the United States, right? Like, why would we do that? Certainly every post-college diploma, but I would still, I would do it. There's a million foreign students uh, studying in the United States at any given time. Like, I don't know why we're not insisting that they stay home, stay here, and, spend, and start their businesses or their careers. It makes absolutely no sense. There is the majority of uh, computer science and math majors um, Post college, so masters and PhD are foreign born, sixty something percent at the P, at the um, masters level, and it's like fifty eight percent at the PhD level. And yet we kick them out of the country when they're done studying, mostly at large institutions like CU that have massive, uh, you know, support from you know U.S. taxpayers. Makes no sense. Um, Pedro Sorrentino is a venture capitalist out in San Francisco who came through CU and we helped with some visa issues there and he does some investing. In that. So let's follow up on that. There's another, by the way, there's another, it's unshackled and there's another one I read about recently that's like a venture fund that specializes in founders that are uh, foreign born and have, and have specifically have, are having these challenges. John Stokely, second year MBA student. Um, Two things. One, I would love to talk with you about your idea of how to infuse more money into new founders, because um, I've been trying to work around this in the rural setting for a while. Um, but then, second question I have, more, more question, I guess, is as a son of a woman entrepreneur um, that comes from a very, um, not poor, but just above that spectrum, um, and looked at life through different lenses of white male. Um, and competing in a white male dominated world, what advice 
would you say the new builders that you've talked to um, would give to me to help make a better and different future for all? Make sure you're understanding your question. So you're saying, hey, what can I do as a, as a, as a white guy, but with this background to yeah. help new build businesses? I understand the perspective yeah. of the quality and that everybody can make a difference. Um, just having a little helping hand, kicking the ass sometimes. Uh, but, you know, what can the, you know, additional people like my mother, you know, tell me that you've talked to an interview, how, how to make a difference as I try and find my own path in life? <laughs> I go to my true commercial, right? But just um, um, you know, um, I think there's two big questions that people have. One is like, if you really have a heart to do good in the world, either you're going to do systemic change, or you're going to be like on the ground, like helping on an individual basis. I think both of those are incredibly and hugely valuable. But I think that's one choice that you make kind of at this point in your career. I think a lot of new builders would say, I don't want your sympathy and I don't even really want your apology. Like just like either do something that's going to be helpful or do go do something else, not 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 near me. <laughs> and I think that's how a lot of the new builders that we talked to would respond. They'd be like, hey, yeah, hey, appreciate it. Like, like do something that actually be helpful. I don't I don't need you to spend a bunch of time telling me how sorry you are or you know There's feel sorry for me. There is there are a couple of examples in the book of like people who really did help, right? There are helpers in the book as well as new builders. Um, one of them is a guy named Frank Caravallo. And our the heroine in our book is Denaris Mazzara, who started her bakery with 37 dollars in food stamps. Um, and she really got there in part because Frank, who was an immigrant himself, sat with her every Saturday for like eight weeks teaching her how to do spreadsheets. Mentorship. Yeah. But, but both mentorship and sponsorship, right? So he taught her the spreadsheets, they developed a relationship, and then when it's time for her to go get a loan in the bank, he sponsored her, right? He said, She's, she can do it, invest in her, she will succeed. Chapter 16 has some more specific thoughts on how to sort of interact with new builders, how to give them agency, how to see what they're doing and value it. So there's some, some more ideas that you might find helpful in that last chapter. There's also a few policy prescriptions and things like that. And also a few things that you can do if you have either uh, an expertise that you can lend out and, and help out. Um, and we do that's one thing we do really well, I think, in the tech community that, that I would love to see happen elsewhere is that people helping each other out. For all different types of businesses and then we also talk about if you have a little bit of money or a lot of money there are platforms now that enable you to invest in local businesses and if that's something you're interested in um, that's absolutely something you should do but i talked about this earlier like lending your network and and lending power to new builders we've done this a lot when we have done things like this we'll often have a new builder with us and, and like that's been really powerful um and we did i did a denver startup week and a boulder startup week event with uh, Lola and Keisha. I did another one with Kwame from uh, Tattered Cover. You know, purposely like, hey, um, and but all of those were me interviewing them and them getting to really tell their stories. Like, you know, little things, but you know, got stuff came of that, right? Um, and in those cases, or at least in the, the Keisha case, because she runs a network that has even sort of multiplier effects. Oh, question. Oh, uh, sorry. I'm a tech founder, so this was uh, really awesome. I think heartening. Uh, I feel like I'm going through the dark night of soul a bit. So I, yeah. I uh, appreciate this uh, talk. But I had a question for you. At the levels, I don't know if you've looked into this, you can tell me to read the book, but <laughs> at the levels of VC funding, did you find significant differences in how people funded? In my experience so far, it's been people are interested in investing in you know me, a woman founder, but only at a Series A or something like that. So I was curious if you ever looked into the rates of founding at like a pre-seed C versus like a Series A, Series B. I haven't seen the data on that, and I would love to. I'm going to give you a, um, I, this is an open forum, so I recognize what I'm saying is a little out of school, but I will give you an example from my own experience at Foundry. I had been pushing for a few years that I felt like our, our fund investing in particular, because again, that's where our network comes from, um, should be more diverse. And the response I got from 
some of my partners, some were sort of distracted, and other, others were like, well, we're getting, you know, we're seeing a lot of great, you know, potential investments, but we're just not quite getting there. And I was like busy and I didn't focus on it. And I finally focused on it because I looked at our portfolio and we had very little diversity in the funds portfolio. And I realized that we were mistaking, like, I, we were mistaking sort of getting close with like, well, we're doing a pretty good job, right? It's like, well, oh, well you know, I've got tons of finalists who are, are not white men, but you know, I keep hiring the white man. And like, at some point you gotta look at that. And I think that what's happening to you is a little bit of that, right? Which is, it took, me as a founder of Foundry to say, this isn't, we had a big fight about it, frankly, in a Monday meeting uh, a couple years ago, where I was like, you know, the, and, that, and that resulted in, not immediately, but raising another $50 million only to invest in these diverse funds that I was describing, which was the last, you know, dozen plus investments that we've made. And so I think there's a lot of that that goes on, right? And, and when I pushed, in particular, the partner that was closest to it, who was kept making these decisions, and he was the one who kept saying to me, hey, we're getting really close. We're just, you know, we just didn't quite get there on this one. And we didn't quite get there on this one. Because I would bring up, like, people that I knew that were raising that had talked to us, and I wasn't super involved with that side of the business at the time. And, and that was the response. Like, oh, you really love them. Maybe the next fund, right? We want to get a little more, more data, a little more. And I was like, I feel like we've got maybe different underwriting criteria here, or our underwriting criteria are wrong, because we were checking boxes of, like, did you go to Harvard? Did you work at another VC fund? Did you, have, you know, whatever it was. Um, and when we changed the lens on that, we started actually funding some, you know, some interesting and different, different companies. And so far, I can tell you those, I mean, it's early data. Those funds do at least as good, maybe better, because they tend to invest a little earlier for whatever reason, um, than the sort of overall funds portfolio. So I, it, it, I think that's a little bit of what's going on. And I think that's part of what we're trying to, to call attention to. Um, I have an online question. Do the online question quick and we'll, we'll wrap there. Yeah. Um, this is from Laura O'Connell. Right. It's how do you feel about those who view debt as modern day slavery? <laughs> like, it's just like a little bit out there, but we're talking about VCs and convertible notes and debt and all of that. So um, I don't see debt as modern day slavery, actually. I think the ability to borrow money and do something with it is is a good thing. I know we're kind of in an anti-capitalist moment, and I feel like that question is coming from that perspective, and I understand how you can feel disheartened right now with our system, but but I have debt myself, and I'm glad I have it. I think it depends a little bit on the context, right? So we, one of the things I've been interested in for investing is sort of what's an alternative to payday lending? Because that's an area, and you know, there's 100 to 150 million Americans that take it advantage of or getting or getting taken advantage of by debt like structures in that part of our economy. And that that does look a lot like sort of modern day slavery. That's a way of saying it. So I want to I'm not sure that's exactly the language I would use. Um, because I think those are the types of things that we those are the types of language we don't want to throw around too casually. Um, but I think there are some massive issues, structural issues with sort of how we shackle people in that part of our uh, that part of our economy. And so that may be what she's referring to. And I, I, I agree, and I, I am so sure there's a better model for that, and I keep not finding it, but um, I may have found it today. I hope I can have a different model for that to tell you about next time I'm in front here. But um, uh, also companies started by not a white male. Um, interestingly, I think actually he had the experience of, <laughs> of trying payday loans, and, and finally, I think this might be the model. But anyway, so th if that's what, what she's talking about, I, I, I'm sympathetic. But debt more broadly, when used in a way that is sort of not coerced, right? I mean, it's not, hey, I can't put food on my table for the kids because I, you know, I had some astronomical bounce charge because that's what banks do to make money off of people who are not as wealthy. That in used in, in the in that way, I think it's fine. If used in the, hey, I bounced a dollar fifty check and I, you know, I incurred eighty dollars of bank charges and now I've got to go get a payday loan. That's that's more pernicious, and I think that's a fair statement. Well, um, this has been a ton of fun, a terrific, stimulating conversation. Please help me thank Elizabeth. And <laughs>